Blog Talk Radio. Hi, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael Wright. And I'm Jeannie, I'm your co host today. We also have Dr. Tim Hayes and David Hayes on the line. And Michael's on here with us. And the call in number is 646 200 4169. Michael, tell them what's happening today. Well, welcome everybody. It's an awesome day out here in Parab, Nevada. I'm actually sitting in front of a television station, and we're going to have a little bit of a twist on the show today. There's a young lady out here who did the series of workshops we did a couple of weeks ago who's a yoga teacher, and she's created a thing that she's calling Forgiveness Yoga, where she's actually working with people to go through worksheets and identify the places in their body where they have tension, uh, their bodies where they have tension and need to move things. And so she's going to be doing worksheets with people as she does yoga. And she has a television view on a local talk show here. She asked me if I would uh, be on it with her to support her in that process. And so at about 11.30, I may leave the line for a moment or two as uh, Tim and Jeannie and uh, David carry on with the conversation. And then we're going to see how actually listening to the interview that's done on the television station, I'm not sure if it's 5 or 10 or 15 minutes, it's a segment in a talk show, as I understand it. So we're going to see if we can listen in with that. And uh, so I'm going to be taking my phone in to uh, to do that. If it turns out that it doesn't come across very well, then fortunately we have the trio of Jeannie and David and Tim to uh, to take over while I support her on the television review, and then I'll be back on the line as soon as that's complete. So it'll be an interesting experiment to see how it works out. So, of course, our conversation, as usual, is about all of the many, many, many facets of forgiveness. And not the kind of forgiveness that our culture generally talks about. And it's it's really a, a, a challenge to get people on the other side of understanding what forgiveness really means. You know, there's a an interesting quote that comes, I understand it, from Karl Marx. It says, if you want to destroy a culture, change the meaning of its words. Why? Well, let's take the word forgiveness as it comes from the Aramaic. In that, you have a tool with which you can literally heal everything in your life that is unlike love, with which you can literally remove every fear, every hostility, every grief, every pain, every trauma that you have ever experienced from your experience. And so that's what forgiveness means in the Aramaic. It's, it's, it's a technology that you apply to change what's going on inside of you. Now, let's come along where the Greeks take over the teachings of the man named Yeshua. He's popular, popularly known as Jesus, but his name was Yeshua, not Jesus, uh, which means Hail Zeus in, uh, in, from the Greek language. But the Greeks took over and substituted the idea of pardoning in place of forgiveness. So, so the, the technology was removed by changing the meaning of the word, exactly what, uh, what Karl Marx said would happen. And so we have millions of people talking about and going around telling people how they're forgiving others for what's going on inside of them. But we don't have very many people going around changing what's going on inside of them. And because our experience comes from inside of us, if we don't ever learn to change what's going on inside of us, then we get to play it out over and over and over again. Oh, there's a book by that title. I think I think it's called Why Is This Happening to Me Again? And What You Can Do About It. But those things that are inside of us that we don't want to face, that we don't want to deal with, that we don't want to look at, that we'd rather pretend are all about everybody else but me, are the only way to put an end to those cycles. There is no reason... I would offer to live in any form of hostility or fear, except that there's that form of hostility or fear and it's a thousand variations inside of you, and it comes from your experiences in life, from your family's patterns, from your culture's patterns, from your genetics. There are many sources of these things. And so 2,000 years ago, there was a tool that was taught for how to go inside yourself and remove those things. No reason to live with them whatsoever except that they're there. And so we're, we have a, a, a commitment, Jeannie and I, 
And our commitment is to take these tools to every mind, heart, and being on the planet. When we joined in our relationship, that was one of the key components of what our lives are about, is taking this technology to every person on planet Earth. And so here we are in Pahrump, Nevada. We just finished doing a series here, uh, actually starting on, I believe it's the 14th. I don't have the calendar in front of me, but you can check on the website when we get it all finalized. Starting on the 14th, we'll be up in um, in uh, Oregon. Actually, Medford uh, is a possibility. We're not sure. We're looking at that right now. And uh, there's some folks up in um, Ashland that have uh, gotten a hold of the videos and seen lives change. And so we're going to be heading up that direction to support them in taking the work throughout the, uh, the Ashland um, Medford area. So lots of exciting things happening. And then we'll be down in South Florida with a healing medical conference uh, in um, Miami, Florida that we'll be keynoting at. And then we'll be back to Heartland to start a 65-day intensive season the 8th of July. And so if you're ready to take your work to another level, come and play at some or one or all of those events. And we'll look forward to supporting you in understanding this whole internal conversation about forgiveness. So, Jeannie, does that leave anyone with any hands up in the uh, in the phone uh, queue or anything in the um, uh, chat room that uh, I need to be aware of or that we can address? No, looks like looks like everybody's just sitting and listening right now. Okay, cool. Well, David, do you have any thoughts to add before we move forward? Well, you know, Michael, you and I spoke earlier about uh, this yoga forgiveness and the different things that are going on. And I uh, was telling you about a documentary that's called Enlighten Up, and it is based on a do- uh, on yoga, and it's very, very well done. And one of the and one of the yogi masters that's uh, from India that was there uh gave the explanation that yoga is your mind controlling capacity taking practice of how to keep the body and the mind under, under control so i've found it really interesting that someone is taking forgiveness doing you know creating this forgiveness yoga for in essence that really is right in alignment with um, with the work that that you've created and that we're supporting you and genie and taking it to every heart and mind on the planet and uh, it's it's fun to be able to be at this particular time in the uh, evolving of the the world and the awakening of all of it. You know, sometimes within there seems to be this wrap around uh, all of the chaos and the different things and what to expect. And uh, I think it's just an absolute fabulous time to be in this transition of consciousness that's going on in the planet. And I think this yeah, forgiveness yoga is yet another way that uh, it's being expressed out there. Definitely. it's a, It'll be interesting to see how it develops here in this little town of Pahrump, Nevada. And uh, Dr. Tim, do you have any thoughts to share with us this morning? Uh, you've been doing some deep processing the last few days on the show. and Yeah, I think my... Uh... My comment would be that after the last show on Friday, I had a couple of hours set aside, so I did a session of uh, still point breathing. And uh, I I just want to recommend that people try to use as many of these tools as possible because often when I get stuck with a worksheet or have a lot of intense material come up from a worksheet, uh, it's just so valuable to be able to do the still point breathing and or spend some time doing a mind shifter, which is uh, kind of targeted journaling. And uh, together, these tools, uh, I just, I've never found anything better. So anyway, I, I had a very nice uh, still point breathing session Friday after the the call, and I was moved to the point of tears several times throughout the call on Friday. So that was very good. And I think it, it led to a much more uh, comfortable weekend and then the worksheets were flowing more easily so awesome very awesome. very rewarding you uh you shared quite a bit of what was happening for you any particular insights at this point from the the next level of the process i'm sure there are lots of people waiting with bated breath to hear what happened next in uh, in your unfolding uh, process well i think the biggest thing i got to over the weekend is 
that the thing I go unconscious about most often is the fear of losing connection in a relationship. So that was my biggest piece, and of course that's there's more work to be done on that, but it became very clear, and I think the the strongest insight came with the combination of worksheets on a present moment issue and then looking at it through the lens of how is this related to my power person dynamics and that led me to have the key that if my power person was someone who when the stress got up left one way or another <clears throat> either you know used a substance to numb himself out or went to the den to work or left the house to go to work then that helps explain why today I have such fear about getting cut out or losing connection in a, in a critically important relationship. So that's what most of the work was over the weekend. Powerful, powerful to uh, to be in touch with that. And of course, the uh, the thing that runs our lives is what happens inside of us. You know, why does one person have a different response in a particular situation than someone else? You know, what what people tend to do is they want to hook everything that happens in their lives up to what's happening outside of them. But when you really stop and think about it, every participant in a particular experience has exactly the same actual experience, exactly the same actuality, but what happens inside of them you know, a situation that might make one person laugh drives another to tears uh, and another to deep grief and another to sadness and fear and another to rage. Why? Because the sadness, the grief, the fear, etc., are internal. And when we make the mistake of hooking up what's going on inside of us to external events, we just take another step in hiding from us the things that are at the root of our experience. And the deeper we hide them, of course, the harder they are to change. And, and the more people struggle to try to get somebody else to change so that they don't have to experience what's going on inside of them. Once you tap into the Aramaic forgiveness process, then you realize that if your response in a particular situa situation is rage, it's not because of that situation. That situation didn't make you feel rage. It's because the rage was inside of you. Someone else who has grief in response to the same situation doesn't have grief because of the situation. They have grief because they have grief inside of them. And the empowering thing about that is to recognize that all of those things that we would call aberrant emotions, all of those emotional disturbances and upsets are all internal experiences and therefore totally changeable. There's no need, there's no reason to ever hang out with them longer than the moment at which you become aware of them, the moment at which you become aware that they are internal and that they're changeable. And so it's uh, it's awesome to uh, to have that understanding and to be taking the tools of forgiveness. And, of course, as you say, Tim, using all of the different tools, you know from the intensive process that uh, one of my favorite phrases in the workshops is, all of the above, <laughs> every tool, whether it's responsibility communication, whether it's the reality management forgiveness process, the codependent worksheet, the commitment, breathing, uh, every tool is about how to heal ourselves, how to move through the hostilities and fears that take us out of our human experience and our human lives and put us back into the direct experience of love. And there is not a circumstance or a situation in our world in which we cannot be in that, except the one that triggers what we're not willing to deal with to be responsible for. And so I acknowledge you for the, uh, the courage to share what you shared last week about what was going on. And for those who missed those shows, you could tap into the archives or on www.whyagain.com. And or if you have a question or a comment for us, our number is 646-200-4169. That's 646-200-4169. The Reality Management Forgiveness Process is available on www.whyagain.com. On the right-hand side, 
you'll see that Jeannie has placed the link that says Download Worksheets. The first two links under that particular link will give you a copy of uh, a description of how to do the forgiveness process. And the second link will give you a copy of the Reality Management Forgiveness Worksheet process. So Jeannie, any comments, questions? No. Several people uh, on the phone today, more than in the chat room, and um, just sitting there listening. Cool. Well, welcome everybody that's on the phone. Somebody out there must have a question. Push one on your on your keypad, and Jeannie will tap you in to the uh, to the call, and we, you can ask your question. If you've been doing worksheets, are there any refinements? Are there any challenges with that? And if not, then we'll move forward. Uh, you know, Jeannie and I were out at Dr. Androcki's last night working with a young man who uh, just went through a, a relationship trauma, and is taking a hold of the tools and putting them to work in his life. And one of his questions was, well, why should I look at anything that's in my past? What does that matter? And we're not working with the old psychotherapeutic model of you lay on the couch for 25 years and you look for the deep, dark, terrible thing that happened to you and then you fix it and then everything's okay. Rather, what we're inviting everyone to do is to function out of a human life, that is, to function out of the active presence of love. It's easy to establish what a human life is. Just hold a newborn. You've got an experience. You've got a definition of love. Now function out of it because that's what you're designed to do. And as you walk through your life functioning out of that love, if anything shows up, and it doesn't matter whether it's somebody driving down the road that uh, you know does something that you consider to be foolish, whether it's uh, the person you uh, you wake up to in the morning that says something that uh, brings up a response that's less than love, wh- whatever it is, why do we want to look at what's going on? Because our experiences are internal, and the ones we refuse to get in touch with and deal with run us and are, by definition, not changeable. So rather than looking for the deep, dark thing that happens, you walk through your life as love, somebody shows up and gives you the look, and up comes, let's say, fear or rage. Then the worksheet process will collapse the projection out of the fear and rage and give you an opportunity to look directly at the root of that fear and rage. If you don't ever look at the root of it, then being a creator, what you'll be stuck with is creating out of that root. Again, the thing that distinguishes us from one another is what's going on inside of us, not what happens outside of us. Some people in a situation are empowered and powerful, and some people in the same situation cower in terror and fear and tears and grief and pain. Why does one stand up in power and why does one lay down in cower? Because that's what's in the guidance system. That's what's in the mind. And so to the idea of the work is to face and deal with everything that is unlike that state of active present love in you and to process through it, to move through it, and to come out the other side as a being based in love. Michael? Yes, I know that it's it's uh, after uh, it's like eighteen after, and I know you've got to go into the television station. So uh, perhaps Tim or David would address this. A person in the chat room. Um, there's some new people out there, so they wanted to know if there was a simple way of explaining how forgiveness comes from within, and not just letting someone else off the hook for something. Um, that a lot of people are not coming from their heart. And then we have another comment out of the chat room, too. So if uh, Tim or David, I don't know if you need to go on in, Michael, now. Or... Yeah, actually, actually, the young lady who's doing the interview hasn't shown up yet, so I'm waiting for her to arrive to, uh, to actually go in. The interview is supposed to be at 1130. So either of you gentlemen okay. want to take a shot at that, or I'll be glad to jump in. Michael, why don't you get us started if you have time? Sure. Yeah, a, I do. A, I do. A, a simple way of explaining how it comes from within and is not just letting something, someone off the hook for something. 
Right, and and the the idea is if if I'm one of a dozen people in a circle, and and I'm one who has something that's less than love in me, then I'll apply the tool of forgiveness by going inside of myself, and let's say I have the grief response to this event. So I'll apply forgiveness not to the person that I say, you really have grieved me, but I'll apply forgiveness to my grief. Now, I may choose to pardon them. <clears throat> We've been taught a Greek idea of pardoning in place of forgiveness. So I'm going to let you off the hook. You know, what you did was kind of bizarre and off the wall, and, you know, gee, thanks for admitting it, and you see that. So I'm going to pardon that and let that go, but and now I'm going to recognize that I'm the one in the circle who had the grief response. So I'm going to take that tool of forgiveness, I'm going to go inside myself and collapse my projected grief. I'm going to let go of the pretense that you're the reason why I'm grieved and thereby forgiving and letting loose of my grief. And then uh, the person who stands in the same circle who has fear in response to that particular situation. So I'm not going to forgive you for my fear but I'm the one in the circle out of a dozen people who has the experience of fear happening as a result of the stimulus that you provided by whatever it is you did. So now I'm going to pardon you for what you did, if that's appropriate or if I feel like doing so. And then I'm going to apply forgiveness to collapse my fear response to look inside of it and to change what's happening inside of me. Now, if I'm the one in the circle who has the rage response, then the same. I'm going to apply forgiveness not to you, but to my rage. If I stand in the circle and watch you do that behavior and I absolutely viciously hate you, then I'm going to apply forgiveness to my vicious hatred so that I can remove that from inside of me. So the tool of forgiveness is a tool with which I go inside myself and remove what never belonged. Not let other people off the hook because it's there. Does that uh, answer the question? And or Tim, David, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Well, the, the key thought for me that popped into my head was... Um, my truth is, or my reality, is strictly internal, it's unique to me, and is created out of my own thoughts. And that's a yeah. line in the reality management worksheet, and it basically helps explain how I need to look inside to the reality I created, if it's anything that's hostility or fear, and choose to create the, the process that eliminates that, so then I can be in touch with my actual source, my my nature as love. Right on. Precisely. So the person who's asking the question in the chat room, does that answer your question? Is there anything else to add to that? All he all he wrote was thank you. Ah, oh, awesome. Cool. Well, we are absolutely delighted and excited to be on your team and to be able to do that. And I have the young lady that's doing the television of you just walking up to my car, so we're getting ready to go in and do that. So I'm going to disappear for a moment or two if you guys would take over, and uh, I'll be uh, back in just a few minutes. All right. Okay, we're, we're going to hope when Michael uh, goes into the television interview for everybody that's listening, he's going to see if he can lay the phone down on the table in front of them and it pick up their conversation. If it does, we will, for the five or ten minutes, it's just a short interview. But while he's doing the television interview, we will be listening in. And if we see that that doesn't work, then I will just disconnect Michael's microphone and um, we will go on with our conversation. So we'll see how that works. This is the first time we've tried to do this. Um, there is an, another private question that's been coming through that um, I would like someone else to address. And it's in regards to, like, someone either having doing black magic or putting a curse on someone, and they've apparently bought into it. So can David and Tim, can you all add into there? I said myself, what I wrote back was that if you buy into it, yes, but that someone else can't 
do that, that you have to do it to yourself. You bring it on yourself, accept what they're trying to offer, their curse or whatever it is. And um, so what, what's your opinions on that? Am I on target there, or is there a possibility that someone else can affect you with something like that? Well, I think you, what what you ask is directly related to the quote I just read from the Reality Management Worksheet. My reality is strictly internal, it's unique to me, and is created out of my own thoughts. So if someone curses me and I find out about it and I believe that that's real, I begin to create the reality of fear and hostility within my mind and that's the thing that will do the damage. That's the thing that will store the disintegrative energies within my system. And the longer they're there, the longer they have a chance to disrupt the energy system and eventually disrupt my physiology. So I could even give myself a disease in response to someone cursing me. But their cursing me isn't causing the disease. My response to it would be the thing in in the line of this work that would be causing it. David, are you there? I am here, Tim, and I agree with you 100%. And, you know, Jeannie, what comes to my mind is uh, there's a story that Michael talks about, uh, about a witch doctor that, or about a tribe over in a uh, African country, or maybe it was uh, uh, Haiti, that the the person believed that uh, that was brought in, he would believe that he was going to die because the witch doctor had told him he was going to die. And sure enough, in, uh, on the appropriate time when he predicted it, was when the man died. And so this doctor understood that the culture believed in this, and he came, and this particular medical doctor then advocated that he had a cure for this and that he had more magic and so forth. And lo and behold, within, when they would attend with this doctor, then nothing happened to them. And then, you know, I was, I, and then I had the thought of bringing it around to exactly what goes on in our culture and what has been passed down from generation to generation. And it began with this statement that if you don't be good, you're going to go to hell. And a child takes that belief on. It isn't so much the the uh, uh, the language as it is the energy that all of a sudden it triggers and resonates that belief within us, and then people behave out of that. We are always uh, have that. Uh, have that presented to us, and we can call it whatever that we want to, whether it's black magic or voodoo. If you can get some, get someone to believe something, they will take that on. You know, in hypnosis, it's the same principle. And if someone and someone takes that on, well, then they'll start to feel and behave out of that. You know, we often invite people to do this work to take the forgiveness sheet and. That was going to be my suggestion to the person that called in and wanted to know about an explanation of it. It's really difficult and challenging to give a clear explanation in the sense of this is how it works. And if you'll just take the sheet and you and do the work, you will evolve the true meaning and understanding for yourself with it. It's it's the experience of have of learning forgiveness. You know, I've done a few worksheets over the years, and each time that I do the worksheet, I have a little better understanding of what forgiveness is, and though I can't explain what forgiveness is in the same sense that I can't explain what's the truth or explain what is love, I have my own experience of it, and my experience of it and someone else's experience of it is going to be different. We may be in alignment of how the mind works and what it is that we take on, and the body is an energy system. And, you know, just even in that, shifting and changing that perspective of looking at this as an energy system rather than a body uh, of what it is that I'm putting into it, what it is that I'm holding into it, and what it is that I'm letting go of. And so, David, David about, let's, yeah. let, let's hit something right there. This person was asking about being cursed, 
And the other part of my response would be that how I respond to someone cursing me is every bit as important as the fact that they believe they've cursed me. So if I say I don't believe in their curse and to heck with them and they're stupid and that's ridiculous, I'm still I'm mentally thinking that I'm not buying into the curse. But at the same time, then, then I'm, yes, I'm planting lots, lots of anger and hostility and resentment within my system. It may not be the energy that they wanted to give me with the curse, but I'm planting negative energy in my system. So blessing that person, sending them love, even though they may be sending me anger or bitterness or hostility or resentment, sending that other person love is the only way that I get the full experience of my nature as as love. And, and also, there's that. Go ahead. It's Michael. And uh, also another way to understand this is to think in terms of energy systems theory. And if you think about an AM radio and an FM radio, an FM uh, radio station puts out a signal, but you can't get a word that comes across from that FM signal out of your AM radio because there's no resonance there. The only way that someone's supposed curse could affect me is if I'm in the same frequency range. And so if I stoop down, as you're saying, both David and Tim, into the hostility and fear experience, then what I do is I, I create literally a, a receptor, an energy antenna for their uh, rageful curse, if that's what it is. If there's nothing like rage in me, there's no place that that can land. There's just no tuning mechanism for it. And so to be conscious and, and careful of what you attune to, what you buy into in the way of energy becomes a real key in the process. And if someone offers you a curse and that brings up fear for you, there's the, the gift of that curse is I have fear that somebody else could hurt me with their words or their thoughts. And so what I'm going to do is go in and forgive my fear. Now I've turned their curse into a blessing because I perhaps wasn't even conscious that I had that kind of fear in me. So now they've shown me what I need to heal next. What an awesome gift. Everything becomes a blessing to those who hold to the space of love. Otherwise, we get controlled by what isn't real. Is that all together? Is that making sense for the person who asked the question, Jean? Any response? They haven't, they haven't responded. Um, they had started asking some other questions, and I asked them to stop and listen because you were actually addressing their issue. So they haven't responded yet whether that makes sense. So. Awesome. All right. Any other questions or thoughts there? Yeah, you know, I agree with you, uh, Michael, Lynn, that when someone says a word and that word resonates within me, fear, hostility, or anger, then the way, the, and what I hear you say is, is the way that I can send them love is by actually by removing if I have some hostility and fear. And then I'm automatically coming from love. So there's not, that's what I'm uh, putting out there so that then the, the the fear or hostility, and then I'm, I'm reminded of the Course of Miracles. People are either asking for or wanting to give love. And so when I heal my issue that a word may have brought up in me, and, you know, you use the, the, the letters BS, then if someone uses that and resonates something in me, then I need to remove that. And it's, to me, my experience is as soon as I remove that, I automatically know exactly what it is to say or do a be, be because I'm being that higher consciousness of love, of intelligence, of understanding, and that is reflected 
back to the person that I'm engaged with. Well, there's a, you know, speaking of the Course in Miracles, there's a, one of my favorite passages from the Course is, what I see in another, I reinforce both in them and in myself. And if I see them as cursing, then I reinforce that energy in myself. The minute that I see that that's where I'm at and shift it, then as you're talking about, David, I can see they're, oh, they're lacking love. There's a cry for love. There's someone who wants to have their true being supported uh, in this situation and they're lashing out with their anger. But the truth is what they're looking for is someone to provide them the space of connectedness, support, and love. And so here we are with the opportunity over and over and over again to provide that connection to people, to provide that support that takes them right back to their source, to their connectedness. And, you know, again, if you hold the newborn, everybody started out in exactly the same place. Nobody started any different than as a being of love. And so what we can do to support others in moving back to that is our own work. And that's why we'll always reflect it back. You know, sometimes people come, for instance, to an intensive and and, uh, and they'll say, well, but you're always turning this back to me. It's like, yeah, if you're in any form of hostility or fear, the gift that we will commit to giving you is to turn it back and get you to look at your hostility and fear and bring yourself to a healed state. Are you willing to do that? Well, I just want to get into this, you know, get down and dirty. Well, if you do, great, but this isn't the place to do it. We're here to work with healing and to support you in moving through that. And uh now, a lot of times, sometimes people just want to do their little organ recital. You know, they just want to do their whine and their cry and, you know, I'm a victim. And, and we're here to support you, any and every one of you, us, all of us, in moving past those victim roles because the victim roles all come from our own unconscious dynamics and coming into relationship with those parts. Being able to access them is how we can change those internalized experiences and responses. Someone in the chat room, Michael, asked, if you get triggered into anger and are not in a situation to do a worksheet at that moment, do you have any tips on how to calm yourself down? Absolutely. The first thing to do is always to breathe. Take a breath, soften. And, you know, you don't have to have a piece of paper in front of you to look at what's the goal that I put in my mind that is accessing my anger right now. I can do that in a fraction of a second. I don't need a pen and a piece of paper. We do suggest, especially for the deeper issues, that you do the worksheets in writing ultimately. But I'm in the middle of a situation, and I recognize that my mind is out of control, and it's out of control because I loaded a goal that accessed my anger. So I can go in and I can cancel that goal in a heartbeat. And as I cancel that goal, I can once again take a breath go to that deeper part of my mind, see the root of that anger, and make a new choice. While that anger or whatever it was, response was in hiding, I couldn't change it. I had no control over it. I could critically think about it. I can make new choices forever. But it's the moment at which I cancel the goal that I get to see the deeper part of myself that I need to be in touch with and change. And that's when I can change it. So, you know, in, in just a, you know, a, a fraction of a second, you can be into, oh, what did I want? Oh, I wanted that person, instead of cursing me, to approve of me. I wanted their love. Okay. So now I cancel my need for their approval and love. I take a breath. And as I cancel the need for approval and love, I go to the next level where my anger comes from. And I look at and maybe recover the experience of, Gee, being a three-year-old and reaching arms up to daddy and daddy being in the middle of a, an argument with mom just turned and shoved me aside. And here I, his, his anger poured out on me and being of the same genetics, I just took it on. And so now here the three-year-old's acceptance of the energy of anger, the resonance of anger from dad is running me 50 years later <laughs> when somebody you know, pushes me aside, say, and, and if my mind perceives someone cursing me, so to speak, as pushing me aside, then I will be right back there in the energy that my power person poured on me as a three-year-old. 
and, and I'll just fire back with that. When I cancel the goal, I can collapse that whole scenario, and I can change my mind's content. So that would and, be the, the quick fix version. And someone in the chat room said it's easier said than done, and yes, it is. Um, but what we do is, you know, Heather, you've been doing this work now for a little while, but, it, you know, I've done it for six years, but it still just takes practice. And we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and finally it becomes more natural for us. I'm still not there where it's instantaneous, but, you know, we we build that as, a habit like in our in our mind to revert to doing something different instead of the way we always did it. And so just take well, we practice. Call, I call, yeah, we call that the rule of the three P's. Practice, practice, practice. Of course, you're not going to have the skill uh, unless you've really worked at developing the skill. Nobody takes a golf club out of the golf bag and hits a ball like uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's, he's not the golfer, he's the governor that's in trouble right now, isn't he? Like uh, Arnold Palmer, nobody does that uh, first time out of the bag. What does the person who is able to hit the ball like Arnold Palmer do? What does somebody like Tiger Woods do? You know what Tiger Woods is probably doing right now? He is a world-famous golfer, golfer. You know what he's probably doing right this minute? And don't let your mind go to those places now. That's enough of that. He's probably on a golf course practicing his chipping or his putting or his driving. And you would say, well, why would, you know, Tiger Woods have to practice chipping and, and, and driving and putting? Because that's how he remains a champion. He follows the rule of the three Ps, practice, practice, practice. If you want to become a champion, if you want to become a Tiger Woods of forgiveness, then here's what you're going to do. You're going to spend time every day for the rest of your life, cleaning the hostilities and fears out of your mind and forgiving. And as you practice that on a daily basis, you will become more and more skilled. You're right. It's not easy to do, but it can be done. It reminds me of when you say, you know, that we take a shower every day. Is there going to come a point in our life where we say, okay, I've taken enough showers. I don't have to take any more. Um, somebody was talking about 40 years, and I said, yeah, 40 years in the desert before we enter the promised land, but we still have to practice. Like, you know, after you hit your 40th birthday, you don't quit taking showers either. So we have to keep washing and cleaning your mind until we get rid of all of the generations. And I don't know of anybody that's gotten there yet. The other thing I would add, I would add for, I think it was Heather who asked the question, is the, the simple practice of, resetting my filters over intentions and perceptions to love and to just think about how there is a filter in my mind over my intentions and it can be set to fear, hostility, or love. And if I simply say I choose to intend only love and I choose to receive only love, that practice was one of the biggest aids to me when I first got introduced to this work because often I would be spending time driving from one office to another and things would come up in my thought or people driving would be driving erratically and I would find myself feeling something less than love, some anger or hostility or fear. And I started that practice of just resetting the the filters, resetting Rachma, resetting Kuba, resetting my intention to love, resetting my perception to love, And when I first started doing it, I might have to do it 30 or 40 times in a minute, but it got to be easier and easier for that mindset to stay with me. So that's another thing that I would offer. Um, And again, as Michael just said, the more I practiced it, the easier it got, the more it started to come to me um, whenever I would get triggered. Right on track. That's it. And, and and many people are like, well, but I don't want to do that. I just want it all to happen. I, I just want a wonderful life. Uh, why should I have to work at it? Like, well, you, you're going to have the life that your bloodline bred you for unless you choose to become conscious and aware. And, and again, practice. I, I guarantee you the top baseball players on the planet, the top football players, they're out there throwing the ball. They're out there kicking the ball. They're out there hitting the ball. They're out there pitching the ball. They're out here, you know, golfing today, even though they're the world-famous athletes. 
if you want to take charge of your life. Yeah. It's going to be the same process. And so Heather has stated that um, she said she's been working hard, but the last few weeks has been filled with opportunities to heal. And, and Sam says, yay. <laughs> that Just realize that um, as we heal, as we're working on it and as we're cleaning out, we go to a higher level of, of vibration, our frequency, and everything raises and, and by, our vitality increases. And, and that means then that we can go deeper into the garbage and we are more able to heal something that before we weren't. And so as you heal and you do more of your work, then, yeah, a lot of times the bigger stuff seems to pop up. But just stay with your your path and, and where you're heading and don't think, uh, well, this isn't working, it's all still coming up. Someone else so was, asking, has, was asking yeah, about the, the definition of desert, and I think you wrote in the chat room that in this work, Michael equates that to the unconscious, that um, in the ancient language, the word the heart referred to the unconscious and the desert was another word for the unconscious mind, the stuff that we deny and suppress, sometimes without even being aware that we're denying it and suppressing it. Now, there there might be something that I go through and and I I have a very difficult time. It's a painful experience for me emotionally and I decide I'm going to get busy and work. I'm going to distract myself. I'm going to drink and so there I'm actually trying to get rid of or to block or suppress memories of an incident. But I would offer that there's a part of my mind that thinks it's doing me a service that watches for things, and before I'm consciously aware of it, it takes things from my awareness and moves it into the unconscious, and I deny and suppress things without even being consciously aware of it. And all of that, and when I, once it's been denied and suppressed, would be referred to as the desert or the dissociated mind. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, and, and once I give myself permission to move there and to clean it out, the floodgates open. It, it, the process becomes more intense. While I'm holding it at bay and saying, I never want to look at this, the mind is a an obedient servant in that regard. It says, okay, if you want to look, we'll keep it hidden. But but be aware that if you keep it hidden, you just set up a frequency to pull somebody in to do it to you, and they're going to show up and do it. But, you know, what I'll do, here's what I'll do if you want to keep this hidden. If they show up and resonate this that you've instructed me to, to hide from you, then I will keep it hidden, and I'll make a picture that it's all about them. And we'll pretend it's all their fault that we're feeling this, that they're the one with the problem. Well, I love to ask the question, if they're the one with the problem, why are you the one with the pain? You're the one with the pain because there's something in your structure that doesn't belong in your structure. When you give yourself permission to go there, the floodgates can open, and the process can become more intense. Just be committed, continue to do your work, and things will move forward. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome, it's uh, beautiful, and it's not always Dr. Fieldman. Is that right, Tim? Is it always still Dr. Fieldwood for you? Oh no. No, and, and I was I was thinking earlier the, the other part of my processing is now there's this fear about actually putting it into practice. So overtly stating to people in my primary relationships when I'm afraid of something I'm afraid of them leaving or I'm afraid of our relationship disintegrating and putting it out there brings up a whole new level of fear. So it's well, one thing sure. it's one thing for me to be aware of it and do some worksheets about it and maybe cry some tears and do some breathing, but what I'm noticing is as I'm looking forward to the next day or two when I have several of these people to talk to, the fear keeps coming up. So I'll I'll keep you posted on how that works. But All right, and, and David, I know. Fear. I know. Okay, David, I know that it's always Doctor Feel Good for you now, right? When stuff comes up, you just move through it. And... Um, 
it's never it's never Doctor Feel Good when it's when it begins, and it's wonderful when it's complete. You know, it's yeah. Uh, Big point. It's just, it's just part of it. You know. <laughs> Again, you know, I go back to this, and you know me. I'm I'm an advocate of people just putting it to practice. The whole purpose of well, my perception of and projection of the mind shifter support group here is to put it into practice. We can talk about this day in and day out, and we will, and I love talking about it. For my purpose is to support people into putting the pen to the papers you express so that they have their experience of what it is. It's irrelevant, really, of what it is that Michael thinks, or myself, or Jeannie, of what our our reality is around it. We're here to support you, encourage you to look and see. It's painful. And there, there seems to be, and you know, the, the truth of it is, is the pain, as you explained, is the signal to tell me I need to get this out of there. So that's good. <laughs> you know, pain neither good nor bad. It's it's the signal that says, oh, here's a piece of that. And I love it how you do it in the on the the uh, why again uh, book on CD of where that you invite Richard to you know so now that he was talking about the relationship with his wife and the divorce and so forth to look at it and to feel great about what's going on so the pain is just a signal and I can turn that off and as soon as, and it does turn off as soon as I truly forgive it. So I want to know if I've really done the forgiveness work, truly done it. There's no pain. The pain is, is, is irrelevant. So, that, you know, that's just, uh, that's just part of it. What did they call them when I was growing up? Oh, that's right. My mother called them growing pains. <laughs> that's part of the process. Not good, not bad. So that, and that's, that's a good the, point, David. The, uh, the, the, the definition that we offer of pain, when you think of your body, mind, as an energy system, is that pain is a result of holding on to an energy that doesn't belong in your structure. And so pain isn't a signal that somebody else did something to you. Pain is a signal that there's something in you that you need to deal with, that you need to apply forgiveness to, to remove it. And as you remove it, the pain disappears. And I'm talking about, uh, I, you know, we had a young lady a couple of weeks ago who was introduced to this work, came to a, a series of workshops and did an in, uh, just a two-day intensive. When she came to the workshop, she had excruciating back pain to the point where she could hardly move. The first couple of workshops she came to, she would sit for two minutes, she would stand up for five minutes, she'd walk around, she'd move, she'd sit down, she'd stand up, she'd sit, she'd move, she'd stand up. She couldn't do anything. And literally two weeks later, this excruciating back pain, which was heading her down the road to a potentially a very serious surgery, she she texted me and shared that uh, that she had um, uh, just been at a party with some people and had done a backflip and done the spritz. Two weeks, she went from excruciating back pain to a backflip and the splits at a party. And this is a woman who's in her, uh, well, probably late 30s. So pain is the energy that results from holding on to an energy that doesn't belong in us. Are you willing to forgive? If you have to blame everybody else for it, of course you can't change it because it's not yours, it's theirs. Any questions or comments in the chat? Yes, David. Uh, let's uh, tell me the name, if you would please. The uh, the name of the doctor. I think he's in Indiana or Ohio. That uh, the back surgeon that uh, was doing the back surgery. Yeah, actually, it's Doctor Sarno. S A R N O. Check out his uh, his information online. Doctor Sarno is a, uh, um, a surgeon, and and he doesn't he doesn't use a knife anymore. And his success rate, you know, the success of back surgery is a very small percentage of success. And Dr. Sarno, he works for a major university. I don't remember which one it is, but you can check online. And he doesn't touch a knife anymore. And what he teaches people is that their back pain is unconscious rage. And when he teaches people that their back pain is unconscious rage and to look at him to begin to deal with it, their back pain goes away. 
all energy. And of course, Michael, and for folks that uh, really is want to have some of the experiences of it, I'm reminded of the intensive we had a couple of years ago with the young ladies that, that had back surgery and had the disc removed and was walking and had had a decent night's rest and did not slept all through the night in over two years and had been on this medication for two to three years and then after doing. Uh, a nine-day intensive, similar to what you were talking about, the lady doing the backflips of how she jumped in and out of my van and walked up to the walked up the hill, and it's just absolutely incredible. And got her first night's rest that she said that she had had in two or three years. So, and her surgeon, her surgeon told her that now that he'd removed this disc, it was the problem that until he fused the two vertebrae that this disc cushioned, she would be in excruciating pain, and she was. And about the fifth or sixth day of an intensive, we did a still point breathing session, and she got up off the floor and danced and jumped out, as David says, from his van onto a, a, a rocky, uneven surface down at the lake. We live in an energy system, folks, and we got a whole lot more to do with it about it than, uh, and a whole lot more power over it than we've been taught. And the key tool is what are you willing to own, face, and remove rather than pretend belongs to someone else? By the way, I'm standing outside of this uh, television station in uh, Pahrump, Nevada. It looks like the uh, show is not going to call us on until after our radio show is over, so we're not going to be able to uh, to play this segment, unfortunately. We've only got about four minutes left. And I am standing out here in the uh, just outside the back door of the station, and, you know, people think about the desert as this barren place and these the flowers and the, uh, the, the blooming of things in the desert right now is so exquisite. And I'm standing behind the uh, studio, and there's this absolutely exquisite... I have no idea what it is. It looks like it might be some kind of a snapdragon, but it's this beautiful white flower with a tinge of purple around the edges and throughout it. Deep inside of it is this light purple and yellow and the smell of it, if I can transfer it to you folks, is just awesome. What a world we live in. What a place. People are out there making war with each other, fighting, arguing, complaining, moaning, bitching. It's like and there's so much awesome beauty in the world. But of course, there's, a, there's, a great, there's a great uh, uh, quote that says, if you see no gods without, it's because you harbor none within. They're all there. The love of God is inside of us. It's available 24-7, 365, if you're willing to. Take the overlays off. Forgive what doesn't belong. I don't care what kind of a life, what kind of a world you're living in right now, how crazy, how bizarre, how, as David says, unconscious it is. It's all changeable. It can all be removed. And you can go back to a literal, direct physical experience. As Perry shared on the show the other morning, he woke up for the first time with this physical experience of the presence of love in his cellular structure. I would offer that's what you are designed to experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But your bloodline hasn't supported you very well in that. And so there's work to be done. Well, what about if my mother did it? What if my father did it? What if my... What? Hey, it's time to let go all, of all of the what ifs and go, ah, I could go to the experience of love right now if I didn't believe in all of this garbage that holds me back. If, if that's your statement, then begin the forgiveness worksheet process. Go to www.whyagain.com. Right-hand side of the page, there's a link that says Download Worksheet. Pick up the first two links, the reality management process, and uh, there's a set of instructions there as well as the worksheet itself. Put the pen to the paper and begin to undo your belief in the world of hostility and fear. It all comes from inside of you, and as you change what's going on inside of you, everything outside of you has to shift and change. That's what we're here to support you doing. Any questions or comments, Jeannie? 
Well, we've only got about 20 seconds, but someone was asking what about shoulder pain, and I was asking them what kind of weight were they trying to carry on their shoulders. And I think we're about out of time. We've got about 10 seconds. So if everyone will join us again tomorrow, and we hope that you have the best day yet of your eternal life. Blessings.